We miss you and we love you and we can't wait to worship with you in person very soon. And as important as that is, hear this from the Apostle Paul in his first letter to the church in Corinth. Friends, let me go over the message with you one final time. This message that I proclaimed and that you made your own. This message on which you took your stand and by which your life has been saved. He says, I'm assuming now that your belief was the real thing and not a passing fancy. That you're in this for good and holding fast. The first thing he says, I did was place before you what was placed so emphatically before me. That the Messiah died for our sins exactly as scripture tells it. That he was buried, that he was raised from death on the third day. Again, exactly as scripture says. So, let's celebrate our Jesus together. Right here, right there, wherever you are, right now. Let's celebrate our risen Savior. He lives.
for being here today. Thank you so much for joining with us in this time of worship. We hope that you've had a good week. Um, I know uh, for personally, in my own life, um, I'm starting to feel the effects of isolation. Um, this morning, when I looked myself in the mirror, I, I had a fleeting thought that uh, I should get bangs. Um, but uh, um, that's a dangerous place for me to be in, and so if you would just you would just pray for me that I that I wouldn't do that. My hair is not nearly long enough for me to do that. Um, it, it would be a disaster. But uh, we hope that you are having um, a good week. Maybe you've had a rough week. Maybe you've maybe things haven't gone your way. But we are so glad that you're here today. That we get to partner with you. That we get to be um, part of your family this morning, even though we are apart from one another. Um, thank you for being here. We're especially glad if this is your very first time. Time, uh, joining us. If you're a first-time guest, if this is your first time checking out our church, let us know that you're here by texting the word guest to the number 94090. Uh, we'd love to hear your story, so just text the word guest 
to the number 94090. Another thing that we've been asking you to do every single week is to share the live stream of this service. This is your opportunity to share an encouraging and challenging message with your Facebook audience. You never know um, what someone not, might need to hear. So, uh, so take some time. Share the live stream of the service. Use the hashtag God's Urban Renewal um, as we are challenged and we are encouraged this morning. Uh, another thing that I want to remind you of is that this past week we started a brand new prayer initiative called Awaken. And this is something that we are doing um, to, one, intentionally pray for our community, for our world, for our city. But Awaken is also a hope. It is the hope that the church, the global church, would awaken and be everything that God has called it to be. Um, and by praying intentionally for the needs of others, that's just one way that we as a church can awaken together. So please uh, continue to join with us. Uh, we'll post every day on Facebook and Instagram different things that we'll be praying for. Continue to join us. Continue to pray for us as we pray for our city and as we pray for our world. And hopefully there will be an awakening within the global church at large. Um, and then another thing that we would love for you to do is to show us how you are worshiping with us today. Uh, use the hashtag First Lubbock at home and upload a picture of you and your family uh, worshiping with us. You can do that in front of a TV screen, a laptop, or, or however you like to do it. We would love to see how you're partnering with us today. It is such an encouragement to us, and we hope it's an encouragement to you to see that you are worshiping together with our, with our family, even though we are far apart from one another. So, again, just upload a picture and use the hashtag First Lubbock at home. And then finally, one thing that we want to continually remind you is that the mission of the world, mission of the church, excuse me, does not change even though the landscape, landscape of the world looks different. And uh, one way that we have been able to continue to be on mission here at First Lubbock is through your faithful giving. We are so thankful. You have responded so beautifully during this time, and we are, again, just grateful that we get to partner with you in this, that we get, we get to continue to be on mission where our feet are. And here's one way that we've been able to do that. I just started as the university intern, and I've been going here since the middle of my junior year of high school. It was the summer after I had just graduated high school, and I was in that weird limbo of still being a part of the student ministry, but also being enrolled in college and going to college next year. And so it was just like this weird stage of life. And Josh Trice, who is the student ministry intern, would go and play volleyball with the college students on Sunday nights. And so I would just go with them and go and play volleyball. And they just embraced it and they weren't like, oh, you're, a high school student they were like oh hey like you're awesome like we love you like come and be a part of us it was really cool to see that and so just being loved by them and seeing the love that they had for each other and the love that they had for the Lord it made me want to be a part of this community and so it's helped my freshman year of, of college as well because I've been able to be plugged in and I've been able to have people hold me accountable and I've met like the best friends of my life who have so much joy and have so much love for each other and love for the Lord. I'm just glad that I'll be able to do that as the university intern. I'm glad that I'll be able to hopefully be that for somebody else. I'm the preschool intern in the kids ministry and I've done that position for almost a year now and then I've worked childcare for two and a half years previously. The main thing that drew me into wanting to work at First Lubbock was the community and it being like a family and just the mission statement of being on mission where your feet are. So during the pandemic, we felt that it's really important to stay connected with our families and just pour into them as much as we can through social media. And we've realized that it has made a difference. There was a mom that contacted us and told us that her kid had been down in the dumps and was just really distraught over the quarantine. And so, over the week of Easter, we had posted a week long of challenges. The daughter mentioned to her mom that it really helped her to realize that we still love and care about her, even through all of this. And it helped us to realize that what we were doing was making a difference, even though we weren't seeing each other face to face. In this position, I know that I'll be pushed to step out of my comfort zone and to 
lead people in their walks of faith. And I'm excited to grow in my own relationship with Christ, but also to help build other people's relationships in Christ as well.
Jesus, thank you that you have come and that you died for our sin and rose and defeated death. And you live and, and you live with us. God with us. The truth is that, as you well know, many times in our lives we aren't turning our eyes to you. In the midst of everyday life, we turn our, our eyes to our things to do list. We, we turn our eyes to 
the shouting noise that bombards us. We grow weary, even fearful. And we haven't placed our trust in you. In fact, what we've done is we've placed our trust in everything else but you. So Jesus, forgive us. Forgive us as as individuals from our sin, from our shortcomings, our, our failures. And Lord, it set us free then to live the resurrection life with you. Again, as individuals, but also as a church. We can recognize we have power to turn our eyes to you and and we can then love our neighbors, ourselves. We can love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then as a part of the, the universal church, God, or all around the world, awaken us. Burn in us this massive desire to be all that you want us to be, to be used by you, to love the world like you love us and may we see this amazing spiritual awakening God both here and all over the place because we've all chosen to turn our eyes to you Lord Jesus so hear us now as we say that to you again we will turn our eyes to you Thank you, guys. Just uh, another week of this before we look ahead to the 24th and our regathering again. And, of course, you will be receiving a great deal more information over these next two weeks. A uh, plan has been laid out that we think is uh, uh, safe and efficient for the greatest number of, of people to start regathering again. And uh, we certainly look forward to that uh, day. And uh, in between now and then and continuing through this as more and more churches contemplate over uh, contemplate. Uh, how they're going to open and when they're going to open. Uh, our prayers are very much for a great awakening of the Lord's church. And I'm speaking on a global scale that uh, his church will be awakened to their unique role, our unique role uh, in the providential purposes of God, what it is to be a unique and distinctive people as followers of Jesus Christ and uh, the influence that uh, we have. And, and so we prayerfully commit to seeking the face of God and how our spirits might be awakened uh, once again to be the church that we are called to be. Uh, let's open our Bibles this morning again to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter uh, 65 uh, in particular will be our, our primary text this uh, morning. Uh, the truth is, is that uh, you study the nation of uh, Israel, you study their history, and you know that after every exile there is a return. But a return to what? A return to normalcy? As we saw in preceding weeks, uh, Israel's return from Babylonian exile to Jerusalem, it, it was a disappointment. It wasn't near the triumphal entry that they had anticipated, the triumphal return. It was much more of a trickling in than a flooding in. Things were not as they anticipated that they would be. Things looked very different. So uh, a return from exile or a return from any type of life-altering event 
while we may aspire to it being something that uh, is some semblance of normal, we find that normalcy is not really that which occurs. Because what had happened before Israel uh, came to, to be and to find themselves in exile, normalcy had led to complacency. Complacency as to the unique calling that God had placed upon their lives. Complacency that ultimately revealed itself to the people of God just being absorbed into the culture where you could not really tell the difference between those who were believers, those who were pagans, those who were a part of the people of God, and those who were not. So as we think about our, our return. And as much as, I, as much as I have been longing for our regathering, and as much as I'm looking forward to the 24th, there, there is much that needs to be accomplished. Uh, I'm grateful for these next two weeks, this week and this week, to say some things that need to be said as we are returning from our exile experience. Things that I believe will better prepare us as we, as we rebuild, as we come back, as we return, understanding that it'll be a new normal. That hopefully things will be different than they were before. That we would aspire in our anticipation of the 24th that even now we are aspiring to more that things will be different when we return. It's interesting, social media, social media is, is such a, an interesting animal. It, it reveals, people don't realize it, but the things that they comment on, the things that they post, it, it, it's, really, it's really revealing of their, their view of the world. And you really interpret very quickly if someone has a, a, a secular worldview or if someone has a biblical worldview. It's been interesting because some of the most strident advocates that I've seen in, in recent uh, months for, for this cry of, of our civil liberties being returned, that somehow our civil freedoms, our constitutional freedoms are, are under threat, the First Amendment right of assembling together as the people of God. It's interesting, some of the most strident voices on social media people with whom I'm familiar that, that are so strident about our right to assemble and how that's under threat and has been removed and taken from us, it comes from individuals who never went to church in the first place. So what in fact will be different? Is your return to normalcy, not going to church again? Or is God doing something in your heart? Is he making you come to realize that you have taken something for, for granted that should not be taken for granted? That's why we're praying for this great awakening that, that, our, that our return from our exile, our return from our pandemic experience, that it will not just be business as usual, that we will not, uh, that we will not long for just uh, things to just be back to normal the way they used to be. I pray that we want much more. So what do we build? What are we building? Israel, of course, had to return and, and rebuild a temple, but we know that it involves so much more. It was not just about a rebuilding of a temple, but it was about a rebuilding of themselves. Their normalcy before had led to complacency. Maybe the same could be said of, of us. That the old normal, the old life, the old ways uh, before the pandemic, that maybe it had brought us to a place of complacency. Maybe we too in our own lives had become so absorbed into the, into the culture that there's really no just, uh, there was really no discernible difference, no identifiable difference between, uh, between us and our peer groups, between us and our coworkers, between us and our neighbors. As we think about returning, 
as cities begin opening up things, as things start returning to a, to a new kind of normal, I think it behooves us as, as a people to consider what kind of city is it that, that we want to rebuild? Do we want things just really to be as they used to be or are we as the people of God aspiring to more for our church, for our city? One of the things that becomes easily recognized in just a casual reading of Isaiah is Isaiah is very much an urban prophet. 60 times in Isaiah, you'll find him use the word city. And in Isaiah's preaching and his teaching and his message, the idea of a city is representative of the nations. And it's very much a global worldview that, that God has laid on the heart of Isaiah that as, you, as we win the city, Nations, nations are impacted. The world is won through cities. When you come to Isaiah 65, what we have is a, a vision, a vision of a new heaven and a, a new earth. It's very descriptive. And what we have here is a depiction of God's, of God's ideal city of what God aspires the city to look like, the city of God, the people of God, that this is what he longs for the community of his people. These are the qualities and the characteristics that he desires to see evident in the city. And if this is the vision of what God wants, if this is a vision of God's ideal city, then it is the kind of city that, to which you and I should seek to build. See, the prophet has already reminded us back in chapter 58 and verse 12, he has said, those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the age-old foundations and you will be called the repairers of the breach, the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. And so the charge is given to us already that as we begin to open things up, as we think about our city and our economy opening up and churches opening up, some already, some on, on future dates, some at the end of the summer, some into the fall, it doesn't matter when, but as things are opening up, he says, these are the things that I want you to aspire to. You, you he says, you're the repairers. Of that out there that has been broken and devastated by the effects and the impact of sin, the brokenness of humanity, you are the repairers of the breach. You're the ones that, that are the restorers of the streets in which to dwell. And so back in our passage in Isaiah 65, if this is the vision that God has, if he says, this is how a city ought to look, then this is how Lubbock ought to look. You and I, as the people of God, as the community of faith, this is the kind of city that you need to aspire to. You're the repairer, you're the restorer. This is how you as, as believers, as citizens in this particular locale, in this city, this is what you're to build to. This is to be your vision. This is how you want your city to look because this is God's desire for the city. Well, how is that accomplished? How do we build this kind of ideal city that, that God has set before us? Well, it happens, first of all, when you and I, like God, when we go out and we return into our respective movements in the community, being where our feet are, when we go as heralds of mercy. See, that's a quality that's evident in the nature and the character of God. It says there in verse 17, he says, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. First and foremost, the foundation, the city that I'm going to build, it is a merciful place. It is a place that is built upon my mercy and my grace. 
I'm not going to remember your failures. I'm not going to remember your shortcomings. It, it's, it, as God is merciful, he's saying that, that you as my people in building the city that I desire to see, uh, that, I desire to, that I desire to see evident. I need you to be merciful as I have been merciful. You see, mercy is something, it's, it's an action word. It's not just an emotion that is felt. Mercy is, mercy labors for, for restoration. Mercy is something that, that works for, for redeeming situations and, and individuals. Mercy is all about, about renewal. Mercy acts like God on behalf of others. See, you can build this kind of community, as ideal as it may sound, you can build this kind of community in your world when, when at the foundation of it is a spirit of mercy and grace. Not judgment, not criticism, not, not condemnation. All that does is to perpetuate hate, perpetuates division. Uh, hate and judgment is no kind of foundation upon which to build. It begs the question of how merciful we really are. You know, we speak a great deal thematically, missionally, about being where our feet are, being on mission where our feet are. And, uh, and as I read this verse for myself, I, I ask, as I, as I look at my world where my feet are, as I move in and out of my respective circles, how diverse is that circle? When I'm out in the community, when I'm in church, how diverse where I'm at, how diverse is my circle? We're going to see if my, if my circles of, of my concentric circles, if, if I'm merciful, then, then there's going to be great diversity in those circles. There's, there's going to be people in those circles that, uh, with whom I don't share beliefs. I don't hold a body of common beliefs with some people in my circles. There's some people in those circles that, that have lives that are diametrically opposed to, to the Word of God. You see, if, if everyone in my circle just looked like me, thought like me, held to the same values, the same beliefs as, as me, I'm probably not being very merciful. I'm probably not one that has a very gracious spirit that, that is inviting and receiving of, of others and in a, in a way that, that builds relationships. If I'm honest, if we're honest, if we look around in our circles and, and they all just look like you, people probably perceive a spirit of, of condemnation, a judgmental spirit. And I like the way that, that this, the, the way this parallels as it goes forth here. And, and one of the things that becomes evident as, as heralds of mercy, uh, he, says, he says here, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. You're not being judgmental, but again, merciful. I, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing. And her people for gladness. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. And there will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. I'm convinced that merciful, gracious people are also joyful people. It means they, they, they are not focused, they are not spending all of their best energies, their best, re, their best resources, they're not spending energy trying to be judgmental and critical of others. Instead of focusing on the failures of people, merciful people celebrate the goodness of God. And it's evident in their joy, it's evident in their demeanor. Are you truly a herald of mercy? 
It's what it begins with if we're going to build the kind of city that, that God envisions. We don't want to be like the lawyer in the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10, the theologically hair-splitting lawyer trying to settle for the least common denominator, trying, asking Jesus the question, well, who is my neighbor? See, that's trying to settle for the least common denominator down here instead of aspiring to live above that, 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 that least common denominator. Jesus tells the story, you know, about a man that was beaten and robbed. A Levite comes by, a priest comes by, and a Samaritan comes by and take, takes care of the man, bound, binds his wounds, and, and puts him up for a few days to, to, the, to recover. And Jesus asks this lawyer in, in reflection of that, that story, now then, who, uh, who, was, who was the neighbor to this man? And it was the one who showed mercy. You build God's ideal city on a foundation of mercy. So that's the second thing that's necessary, uh, that the city of God is accomplished when you and I live as heralds of mercy, but also as, as advocates for justice. Now, when I talk about being an advocate for justice, uh, an, advocate is someone, uh, an advocate is someone who speaks for the powerless. Someone who speaks and goes to bat for the disenfranchised, the marginalized, those who, who are in no position to have leverage against others. It's being a voice for those that are not in power. It's being an advocate for those that, that are in the minority, the least of these among us. And we see it described very vividly here in these, in these verses. And the thing that, that rings forth in my mind as I read each one of these qualities for someone that is an advocate for, for justice, it, it reminds me of Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in verse 24, uh, where, where Paul says, let, let no one seek his own good but that of his neighbor. See, we need to hear that, church. That, that is a biblical worldview. When you are being bombarded by, by these secular voices on social media that constantly want to harp upon, upon, uh, upon our freedoms and constitutional freedoms and, and civil liberties, that's a, that's a, that's a secular worldview. As I said last week, even Plato, from his secular worldview, uh, even he recognized that, that the downfall of a, uh, of a republic is when individuals stop acting for the greater good and start acting for themselves. And in God's ideal city, it's accomplished when we are advocates for justice. For the least of these among us, I want you to listen to these, these verses, and I want you to see what God is for. He says, no longer will there be in it, the new heaven and new earth, God's ideal city, no longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his days. For the youth will die at the age of 100, and the one who does not reach the age of 100 will, will be accursed. God's an advocate, it seems, for public health for children and the aged. See, if, you're gonna, if, we're, if, we're, going as the flag, if, if we're going to wave the flag of being, being pro-life, it has to be more than anti-abortion. Are you an advocate for life? For, for, the, for, the, for the newborn? Are you an advocate for life? Are you pro-life for the aged? They will build houses and inhabit them. <laughs> Housing for all. They will also plant vineyards and, and eat their fruit. They will not build and another inhabit. They will not plant and, and another eat. Huh, food, food for all. For as the lifetime of a tree, so will be the days of my people. 
And my chosen ones will wear out the work of their hands. Hmm. Jobs for all. They will not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they are the offspring of those blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. Family support systems. Verse 25, the wolf and the lamb will graze together and the lion will eat straw like the ox and dust will be the serpent's food. They will do no evil or harm in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. In God's city, there will be no no violence. And what we find, church, is we see God being an advocate for justice. It's very telling, church, because when we when we hear these things, when we see these qualities and these characteristics of, of God's advocacy for justice, in our mind, immediately upon hearing these, they clash. They clash, and they're in contrast to, to some of our opinions based upon our based upon political viewpoints. Sometimes our thinking on these issues is skewed by by partisan politics to a degree that that we have forgotten what God's Word says about such things. See, and there's the difference between a biblical worldview and a secular worldview. And we can't just discount these verses, these kind of verses. I mean, I mean to, say that, to say that this doesn't really matter, to say that, well, yeah, you know, that's the kingdom of God, but, but you know, we're really talking about politics right here. Uh, to just discount it and to have no, no consideration, no advocacy for the poor is to cut out about 400 verses of Scripture that deal specifically with the poor. You're just saying, in taking scissors to 400 verses of Scripture, 60 of which speak directly to advocacy and justice in the city. You see why Scripture has to be our, our touchstone. And listen, don't think when you hear these things, don't think because we recognize the tension and the clash with with some some of our minds as they have been skewed by partisan politics as we see the conflict that is that is created here. Listen, don't think that 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 well what's gonna happen is we're gonna step into eternity and God's gonna hit a switch and all the map and automatically you're gonna start loving what you have despised here on earth. That doesn't happen. Stepping into heaven doesn't doesn't transform you. It doesn't make you start loving what you have been despising on earth. No, these are are the things we're laboring for. The, The switch was hit at our conversion, at our conversion when we were born again. That's when the mind starts, begins. That's when the transformation of the mind. As Paul speaks to in Romans 12, being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And our conversion is when our mind begins the process of being being spiritually, dramatically, divinely transformed, where we start altering our thinking to stop thinking like the world and start thinking biblically like the mind of God. And as we continue to be transformed in our thinking, it is completed in eternity. But you don't just go from living life now and despising some things and despising some people and then start loving them in eternity. It just doesn't happen. A final thing that is necessary for us in building this ideal city that we desire to return to It happens when you and I live as models of faithfulness. That's really what's being described here in verse 24. Isaiah says, it will also come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. I love that analogy that that is used here because uh, because it, it shows intimacy. It will also come to pass that before they call, I will answer. 
And while they are still speaking, I will, I will hear. Faithfulness is, is one of those qualities that result from intimacy and relationship. See the intimacy that, that comes forth here? They, uh, before they call, I'll answer. Before they, before they, while, they while they're speaking, I, I will hear. You see the intimacy of that relationship? It sounds like, sounds like a covenant. Sounds like a marriage. Sounds like a, a close friendship. I mean, a marriage relationship, when you have that kind of, of intimacy, you know, you, you, you know what the other person is thinking. I know Patty in a way, I, I know what she's thinking. I know what she's going to say. I, she knows me. She knows what I'm thinking. She knows what I'm going to say. We've been in social settings before where we're in different parts of the room and she hears somebody say something and her eyes will immediately cut to me and mine will cut to her and she just shakes her head like, no, don't, don't say that. Don't say it. Don't say it. And we'll get in the car and I said, can you believe that guy said, she said, oh, I was so glad you didn't say, I just knew what you were going to say. Intimacy and relationships, no different from God. And intimacy is, is accomplished through, through little things. It's not the grandiose things in, in a relationship that, that bring about intimacy. It's not a big over-the-top celebration for Valentine's or anniversary or Christmas. It's little things. A shared covenant. Shared beliefs. Shared commitment. I'm always perplexed by young ladies that, that grow up in church Supposedly had this, this, this close relationship with Christ that longed to have a husband that is godly. And they get married to some, some old boy and then they're, they're coming and say, coming to me and saying, you know, oh, just pray with me. You know, I just, I'm just so frustrated trying to get him to go to church. You know, just trying to get him to, to commit his life to the Lord. And I'm saying, did, you know, you know what I, I think, did y'all not talk about that when you were dating? No. Which always makes my mind wonder if you're not, if in a dating relationship, one that, that is becoming emotionally attached, that it's evolving and, and growing towards marriage, a covenant to coming together as one. If you're not talking about those godly things that are so important to you, you say, seems like the focus has been on the ungodly. And the ungodly never becomes godly. It's little things in a relationship that bring intimacy, shared covenant, shared beliefs, shared values, shared interest. It's no different in, in intimacy and in creating intimacy with God. It's just the, it's the little things, little consistent things Bible study, prayer, consistent worship, giving, serving, worshiping. Yeah, all, it's all these little things that play together that create this growing intimacy with, with the Father. It's true in all aspects of life in building relationships with people. You know, me building relationships with people out in our community from all walks of life it doesn't happen because of some great sermon. They don't hear my sermons. They aren't coming here. They're not listening. They're not dialing up First Baptist. They're not getting online and listening to my sermon. Those sermons out there are not the result of great sermons. Just little conversations. Little words. It's not great miracles. Little deeds. Little things that show you care, that you're merciful. It's not a big bolt of lightning. It's just being a consistent, shining light in people's lives. Now, when you see these words about a new heaven and a new earth, don't think that these words stand alone. These words, these qualities, 
being heralds of mercy, advocates for justice, models of faithfulness. These are not standalone words for Isaiah because every one of those qualities, they're repeated and they're confirmed in the book of Revelation. And what it says to us as the church is that these qualities, these virtues to which we are to aspire, they were important to God not just in Isaiah's day, they will be important to God not just in his eternal day, they are important to God right now in our day. This then is God's vision for the city. Why not Lubbock? Why not you and me being the rebuilders, the repairers of the breach so that God's vision of a city might be accomplished here and now. Let's pray together. Our Father, we hear your words, the challenge of your words, to be restorers of the breach, rebuilders of that which has been broken. And Father, as we move back to our regathering again, as we move back as a community to rebuilding Father, might we aspire to more than just a return to normal, an old normal, where in fact your church and your people had become complacent. But the Father, that our desire might be a rebuilding according to your vision, your hopes and your desire and your heartbeat, that we would truly be advocates for that which you advocate. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.